Hello, and welcome again. When recently I began this series, I gave no, gave no thought to producing an episode of a personal experience. Throughout my life, though, I've had many what uh, you would call enigmatic events. This, however, occurred only a few hours ago, about 2.05 in the morning at my home and studio in Saginaw, Michigan. Today's date, May 31st, 2018. About 9.30 p.m. last night, May 30th, we had thunderstorms roll through the area, the remnant of subtropical storm Alberto. There was a lot of wind, thunder, and lightning, and, and rain, but by 2 a.m. the storms were long cleared out of the area, though rain was still falling sporadically. I'd been sleeping soundly, but woke up about 1.55 a.m. with a severe shoulder pain. So I got up and took some ibuprofen, checked to see if my uh, cat Charlie was nearby, and then I returned to bed. I didn't drop off back to sleep as my shoulder was really very painful. But as I laid there, a bright flash lit up my room, and I remembered thinking, wow, looks like another round of storms coming in. And I waited for thunder, but none came. After what seemed like, oh, only maybe four seconds, I heard a loud metallic grinding seemingly coming from the sky to the southwest, which is the direction that our storms usually come in. Charlie, my cat, is seldom scared by anything, but he darted into my room and got as tight to my side as he possibly could. And I looked at my phone, and by that time it was 2.10 a.m., and then there was nothing else. In fact, I set my phone to record and, and put it in my window and just let it run uh, while I was falling asleep. And then my thought being that if something else happened, I would have a record of it, but nothing else did. The strangest, strangeness, though, was not over yet. This morning, about 8, I walked down to the corner store to pick up a few supplies. And I know the staff there quite well. We're all friends. And I don't want to give names, as I don't want to get anyone into trouble. The manager checked the security footage from their cameras uh, for the uh, time that the event happened for me. Now, she was perplexed, and she told me, well, this is odd. Never happened before. And what was it? The security cameras went down at 2 o'clock a.m. for no apparent reason. There was no power outage or anything. And then just as suddenly came back at 2.30 a.m. Now, of course, this may just be a weird coincidence. But the whole thing is kind of weird, especially when you realize that this type of flash and sound has been gro a growing phenomenon around the world over the past four or five years. Now, I'm going to insert here three video clips from YouTube that show... Um, and record the sound which is that people are hearing which is very very similar to what i heard this morning except in these clips it is more drawn out the actual event as it happened to me this morning probably was maybe 20 seconds in duration the entire thing from the flash of light through the grinding weird noises in the sky so let's take a look at these clips and then i will be back with you in just a moment
There are, of course, many theories about what is behind these peculiar events, the noises. Some are extremely weird, but let's take a short look. A report from Inside Edition said that no one seems to know where the sounds come from. Recently in Sweden, odd noises sounding like a trumpet were heard in the sky. A similar sound was heard in Michigan. As I said, they were heard all over the world. Dr. Glenn McPherson has created a map as a database, and to date there are some 17,000 plus events similar to mine documented. And Dr. McPherson believes that at least some of the sounds are caused by low frequency waves. But what's causing the low frequency waves? Others are convinced that the flashes and sounds herald a coming apocalyptic event, even Christ's return. And still more believe these are preceding a major earth uh, pole shift. And yet even more believe this is all preceding an alien invasion. Now, personally, I don't know. But they likely originate in what I like to call the dimension of the weird. If you would please, let me know your thoughts. Let me know if you've heard any of the sounds. And I appreciate your being here. I hope you've enjoyed the video. If you have, please click subscribe and hit the bell icon so you don't miss out on any new upcoming videos from the Dennis Morrison channel. And thank you for uh, watching, and I will see you soon. Welcome. You know, you must admit some very weird things take place on this old globe that we call home. Some are, well, beyond explanation, and some are thrust on us by circumstances which are beyond our control. This program is about a man who found himself in a dire situation. His name, Alfred Packer. His ticket to the dimension of the weird, becoming a cannibal. Think about what you may have done if it had been you as you listen to this. We never quite know what we're capable of, do we? It was April 1874. The place, Los Pinos Indian uh, Agency, Cochitopa Creek, Colorado, and a man very ill and nearly frozen to death stumbled into the agency. And the story the man, Alfred Packer, related was curious indeed. Packer explained that he and six others left on a trip in the previous fall, 1873, a trip which had been, he had been warned was ill-advised and possibly fraught with many dangers. Well, <clears throat> on, their, on their trip was uh, seven adventurous souls, and they found themselves, shortly, mired in, if you will, by a wild snowstorm. Uh, my friends, if you're the squeamish type with a sensitive stomach, you may want to take a Prilosec here. Packer explained that it fell to him to venture forth in an effort to find a path home for the unfortunate party. And whilst he was gone, one of the group killed everyone else with a very nefarious purpose in mind, his own survival. What's nefarious about that? Well, imagine Alfred Packer's horror when he returned to find the sole living member feasting, if you will, on the remains of his companions. Anyone for a fine Chianti? In order to ensure that he did not become a main meal course, Par Packer killed the cannibal. Ah, <laughs> the irony of that murder. Alfred Packer was trapped in the frozen wilderness. He was starving. And guess what? He found himself forced to live off the remains of the travelers and the cannibal which he had killed. To investigate Packer's grisly tale, officials from the agency ventured to the scene of the heinous campsite, and they found what they likely hoped that they would not. 
the hacked up, half eaten remains of his former traveling mates. Now, what would this short tale be without a, a bizarre twist of fate at the end? Well, here it is. Alfred Packer was briefly jailed, but he escaped, and he actually lived out his life peacefully in Colorado. But there was one very big change to his life. He became a devout vegetarian. <laughs> That's right, he couldn't eat meat again after that. Well, if you've enjoyed this uh, weird tale, please consider subscribing. And if you do subscribe, please click that bell icon so that you don't miss out on a single new program from my favorite channel, the Dennis Morrison channel. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you soon. Welcome to another episode of Dimension of the Weird. You know, in the last episode, I told you about a mysterious flash of light in the night sky, followed by an eerie uh, metallic grinding noise. Then, there was a missing security footage for the exact time I had witnessed those enigmatic events. Please look at that episode if you haven't yet. It, it, it kind of sets the pace for this one. It turns out... There was more high strangeness that night here in Saginaw, Michigan. My friend, Barry Gilalberg, lives a couple of miles from me on Stroby Road. And his house, I am guessing, was built in the 1920s on uh, the backyard of Spenced Inn, which makes this story even stranger. The events I witnessed took place about 2 a.m. to 2.10 a.m. At that time, Gil was wakened by noises in his backyard. The grass in his yard is lush and green. But the sounds he heard suggested something quite different. He heard what sounded like people shuffling their feet along in dried grass. Well, Gil lit a cigarette and proceeded through his dark kitchen, whose window looks out over his back lawn. He was mystified to see nothing, yet he could still hear the eerie shuffling. The eerie shuffling of feet. And Gil has lived there a long time and claims he has never heard the sound before. So then how does this tie in with the phenomenon I witnessed that same night? Perhaps it doesn't. Still, it's very odd that these events happened the same night at the same time, coupled with the missing security footage. Now I'm wondering if there might be another explanation for the ghostly sounds, as they were re very reminiscent of an event that happened to me many years ago now, when I was living with my dad and mom up in Oscoda, Michigan. And I refer you to a video I did called A Weird Night on Cedar Lake Road, and I'll put a link to it in the description. But briefly, <clears throat> what happened was it was a, a summer night, very hot, warm and humid. And my parents' house was on a, on a hill that sloped down to a railroad track in a gully. And right beyond the railroad track was Van Etten Lake. Well, this particular night, um, my brother... Frank and his wife Jean and their kids uh, Sherry and Tammy were visiting us and they were sleeping in the back bedroom of the house which overlooked the backyard and the railroad track and the, uh, the lake. Well, I slept upstairs, my, be my bedroom was upstairs and it was always incredibly hot in the summertime and as I laid there trying to sleep and couldn't because of the heat, I heard the strangest noises in the backyard. It sounded like things being dragged across the yard, and you could hear the muffled voices of people. And as I looked out my upstairs window down towards the railroad tracks, 
I could see blue and green lights in a, in a hazy fog because the, the uh, humidity was just hanging in the air that night. Well, no, I saw nothing though. I couldn't see anybody in the backyard. All I could hear were the sounds. And occasionally it sounded like chains being dragged across the backyard. But there was nobody there. And those weird lights were definitely out of place. The next morning when we got up, in the sand of the driveway, you could see ridges where something had been dragged across. And that there had been nobody there that I could see. Now what I didn't know at the time, and I didn't find out till years later, is that in that backyard was a late Woodland Village uh, Indian village site. And as I excavated that site, there were some peculiar artifacts that were found. And again, I'd refer you to another video I did on the As mysterious Ascota image stone. Did the weird sounds of that night have any connection with the spirits of the people who had dwelt there as many as 15 to 1600 years prior to my family living there? With the weirdness of some of the artifacts that I found, I believe they did. Now, bringing this back to Gill's Yard, I wonder if test excavations were done there. What might be found? Could there have been an Indian encampment there? Certainly, Saginaw, uh, what is Saginaw now, was heavily occupied over thousands of years with Native American peoples. And of course, who knows, there could be an historic period cemetery there that was forgotten and then again maybe there's nothing but you have to admit that what I witnessed that night with the flash in the sky and the metallic sounds coupled with that missing security video from the store just down the road from me and what Gil heard in his yard certainly comes sounds like it comes from the dimension of the weird Thank you for coming by. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, please subscribe and click that bell icon for updates of future videos here on my favorite channel, the Dennis Morrison channel. Until then, have a weird time. God bless. Welcome to another foray into the dimension of the weird. Anyone who was a child of the mid-1960s will remember Carolyn Jones. She was a cultural icon of the day. She portrayed the, the, the raven-haired Morticia Adams on the ABC TV hit comedy The Adams Family. And of course she was also well known for many fine film roles. Now one would think this actress who played such a macabre yet humorous role would have had more than a passing acquaintance with the paranormal and the dimension of the weird. But such was not the case, but Miss Jones had a most interesting otherworldly encounter when she was only six year, or eight years old, excuse me. I'm your host to the dimension of the weird, Dennis Morrison, and let me share with you her story. The incident occurred in Amarillo, Texas, when, as I said, Carolyn Jones was but eight years old and her family had a close relationship with their neighbors. Joyce, the oldest daughter of the other family, was killed in an auto accident one Easter Sunday while driving home from a Missouri school for the holidays. Now, on Easter Sunday one year later, one year later, Carolyn accompanied her family on a visit to Joyce's family. The sudden ringing of the phone interrupted the conversation and everyone became tense, remembering that Joyce had telephoned on holidays one unable to come home. 
Reluctant to answer, Joyce's mother asked Carolyn to pick up the receiver, and Carolyn did so and reported that the telephone operator said she had a collect call from Joyce, so-and-so. The adults thought that Carolyn was displaying a most macabre sense of humor until Joyce's father picked up the phone and he listened. He heard Joyce's voice saying, Daddy, I can't get home. And the shock was so great that he fainted. Uh, Joyce's parents later tried to trace the call. The telephone company told them it had no record of a collect call made <clears throat> to their number. You know, it's not unusual for the telephone to play a role in paranormal encounters. Many of us have had similar instances. I have. It was, mine was in the mid-1960s when uh, the Vietnam War was on. And we lived on a quiet private drive. And the people who lived across the road from us, their name escapes me, but their son was stationed in Vietnam. Well, this particular weekend was a holiday weekend, and the family <clears throat> left for the, for the holiday. Well, it was on a Friday night, I remember, and our phone rang, and my dad picked it up, and, and it was the son of the people across the road who was calling to wish to greet, you know, give them season's greetings on the holiday. I don't remember what holiday it was. But he asked my dad where, where his parents were, and my dad told them what he knew. And he told, asked my dad to tell them hi and that he loved them. Well, the next week, the family across the road found out that their son had been killed. Tragically, as so many lives were lost over in Vietnam. But he had died three days prior to that phone call. Who can explain these things? No, I can't. But I hope you've enjoyed this short foray into the dimension of the weird. And I hope that you'll come back. And that if you've had any experiences that dealt with the telephone, or any other paranormal episodes in your life, please feel free to share them in the comments below. I know I'd love to hear them. And I'm sure that all my viewers would. This is Dennis Morrison from The Dimension of the Weird. Have a good night. Welcome back to my Dimension of the Weird. I'm your host, Dennis Morrison. The enigma that is the UFO has had a long and fascinating history here in the United States, well, throughout the world. In 1897, a UFO flat began in California and spread out from there across our nation. And one of the most interesting encounters occurred in Kansas and was detailed in the Farmer's Advocate of Yates Center, Kansas on April 23, 1897. Following is that fascinating account. And I quote Airship takes cow, the thrilling experience of a Woodson stockman. Honorable Alexander Hamilton of Vernon came to town last Wednesday, April 21st, and created quite an excitement by announcing that he had been having some experience with a much talked about airship. Now, Mr. Hamilton is an old settler, was a member of the legislature in the early days, and is known all over Woodson, Allen, Coffey, and Anderson counties. Um, this was told to a representative of the advocate. Mr. Hamilton said, last Monday night, about half past ten o'clock, we were awakened by a noise among the cattle, and I arose thinking perhaps my bulldog was performing some pranks. But upon going to the door, I saw, to my utter amazement, an airship slowly descending over my cow lot about 40 rods from the house. 
Calling Gid Heslop, my tenant, and my son Wall, we seized some axes and ran to the corral. Meanwhile, the ship had been gently ascending until it was not more than 30 feet above the ground, and we came up to within 50 yards of it. It consisted of a great cigar-shaped portion, possibly 300 feet long, with an undercarriage. The carriage was made of panels of glass or transparent substance alternating with a narrow strip of some other material. It was brightly lighted within and every detail was clearly visible. There were three lights, one like an immense searchlight and two smaller ones, one red, the other green, and the large one was susceptible to being turned in every direction. It was occupied by six of the strangest beings that I have ever saw. There were two men, a woman, and three children, and they were jabbering together, but we couldn't understand a syllable that they said. Every part of the vessel, which was not transparent, was of a dark reddish color. We stood mute in wonder and fright, and when some noise attracted their attention, and they all turned their light directly upon us, immediately upon catching sight of us, they turned on some unknown power, and a great turbine wheel about 30 feet in di diameter, which was slowly revolving below the craft, began to buzz, sounding precisely like the cylinder of a separator, and the vessel rose as lightly as a bird. When about 30 feet above us, it seemed to pause and hover directly over a three-year-old heifer, which was bawling and jumping apparently fast in the fence. Going to her, we found a cable about half an inch in thickness, made of the same red material, fastened in a ship, or excuse me, in a slip, not around the neck, one end passing up to the vessel and tangled in the wire. We tried to get it off, but could not, so we cut the wire loose, and stood in amazement to see ship, cow, and all rise slowly and sail off, disappearing in the northwest. We went home, but I was so frightened I could not sleep, but arose early Tuesday morning, mounted my horse, and started out to find some trace of my cow. But coming back to Leroy in the evening, found that Lank Thomas, who lives in Coffee County and three or four miles west of Leroy, had found the hide, legs, and head in his field that very day. He, thinking someone had butchered a stolen beast, had thrown the hide away, but had brought it to town for identification, but was greatly mystified in not being able to find a track of any kind on the soft ground. And I went home last night, but every time I would drop off to sleep, I would see that cursed thing with its big lights and hideous uh, people. I don't know whether they are devils or angels or what, but we all saw them, and my whole family saw the ship, and I don't want any more to do with them. Mr. <laughs> End quote. Mr. Hamilton looked as if he had not entirely recovered from the shock, and everyone who knew him was convinced he was sincere in every single word. To add credence to Hamilton's testimony, the newspaper also printed the following affidavit signed by 11 men who knew Hamilton well and vouched for his truthfulness. The affidavit read, and I quote, as there are now always and always have been and always will be skeptics and unbelievers whenever the truth or anything bordering on the improbable is presented. And knowing that some ignorant or suspicious people will doubt the truthfulness of the above statement, now therefore we the undersigned do hereby make the following affidavit, that we have known Alex Hamilton from 15 to 30 years, and that for truth and veracity we have never heard his word questioned, and that we do verily believe his statement to be true and correct. Signed by E.V. Horton, who was state oil inspector, H.H. H. Winter, banker, H.S. Johnson, pharmacist, Alex Stewart, justice of the peace, F.W. Butler, druggist, H.C. Rollins, postmaster, and the hunt sheriff, E.K. Kellenberzer, M.D., J.H. Stitcher, attorney, H.Y. Meyer, druggist, and J. James L. Martin Register of Deeds, and it was sworn on the 21st day of April, 1897. Now, as may be imagined, much com comment was forthcoming in various Kansas newspapers about this most mysterious event. What were the great airships? Most of them that were seen were cigar-shaped, and I believe the uh, flap lasted a couple years. But uh, what were they? <laughs> we don't know any more about them than we know about the UFOs that we see today. Many people believe they're from extraterrestrial sources. Many people believe that they're demonic fallen angels, which I can understand. Part of the grand deception before the Lord Jesus returns to take us uh, or leave us, depending on our uh, state of salvation. 
But they may be something totally different too. Who knows? They've been with us since the beginning. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this little uh, saunter back into 1897 to look at what was indeed a very curious UFO case involving those strange cigar-shaped airships. If you enjoyed this, please be sure to subscribe, click the bell icon so you don't miss out on any more programs here from the Dennis Morrison channel, and thank you, and please keep watching and looking for me to return from the Dimension of the Weird.